we can do synthetic depth of field. I have physics in quotes. Obviously, light field camera has its own physics, so it's not beyond physics. It cannot be, but it's beyond the physics of a single lens camera. Um, and that's very interesting. You can do depth of field where you have several depth planes. You can shift the depth plane. You can uh, do the depth plane completely different than just a physically lens-based depth. So you can say up to a certain distance, everything is perfectly sharp, and then it's perfectly blurred, uh, and not just uh, with a normal optical flow function. Um, we can have synthetic motion blur, and we have many, many more things that we can do. So this is the motivation why we do this. These things you have already seen as some of the applications um, in Torsten's talk, so software refocus. We can do perspective change. Uh, we can do 3D reconstruction to a certain extent, and we can make new depth of field experiences. Introduction to light field video. Uh, also there, you have already seen a little bit. I'm the professor, so I'm damned to do a little bit of theory also um, uh, and tell you what yeah, I, I find fascinating uh, about light fields. So normal photography, I guess at least a third of you are very familiar with light fields. So for you, it's a bit boring, but maybe two thirds um, are interested in what the real difference is. Um, on the normal photography, each point on the convex hull of a scene is uniquely mapped to the sensor or to one pixel on the sensor. Um, a single lens, hence the physics of the lens, determines the image. Um, a single shutter, also important, because rolling or global, it, def it defines the temporal characteristic of the whole image. People sometimes forget about this. I'll come to that when I talk about our rig later on, because there was the question, oh, light field, not light field. There's a typo, I'm sorry. Um, there was a question of why we decided, or why Torsten decided for a rig rather than a single lens camera. I'll explain um, with a temporal domain. In light field capture, each point, and even beyond the convex hull, because the convex hull from one view might be slightly different than the convex hull from another view, so another view can look a little bit uh, behind, right? So beyond the convex hull of a single view um, is mapped to several sensor points. Um, a light field here, a rig, not a single lens camera, is controlled by multiple lenses. Um, in our case, you'll find it's 64 later on, uh, but very modular, so it could even be more. Um, and it's controlled by multiple shutters, which is extremely interesting because if the cameras can be made in a way that they shoot their image at different points in time, you can treat spatial with temporal resolutions. Every one of you since decades is aware of interlaced in TV. That was exactly the same motivation. We didn't have the bandwidth, so we needed to separate the image. Um, and then you could trade vertical resolution with temporal resolution. Now we have four dimensions in the light field plus the time. So you can really very, very sophisticatedly treat spatial angular resolution with temporal resolution. Um, yeah, and therefore we have five dimensions. Um, they are required for time, sub-aperture, and the single view photograph. As said, I'm a professor, so there always must be one slide that has at least a formula on. Um, it's a very simple, and you, you are dealing with uh, light transmission anyhow, so this is uh, everything boring for you. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we designed uh, our array. So our array geometry is dis de defined or dis uh, designed in a way that we have chosen baselines, lenses, focal lengths of the lenses uh, with respect to the sensor sizes in a way that there is a very significant ob overlap so that it's really not just a multi-view image but really a light field where all the cameras at least partially see the same part of the scene. Here's an example where I say the most left camera should extend its view in the focal plane to at least the center of the most right camera. Right? If that's the case, then you can calculate with the geometry a little bit. And in our case, this leads, I give you the numbers because you see some videos afterwards. And in the videos, you will see a certain, let's say, arrangement of the array. And this is this arrangement where we have roughly a baseline of 100 millimeters uh, between the different cameras, um, which means that we have an array size of roughly 80 by 80 centimeters. You will find out it's 64 cameras later on. Um, and this is true if the distance is two meters with our parameters. Um, obviously, you can freely adjust uh, that one. You can adjust the baseline. You can change the lenses um, to adjust to the scene that you, that you have. But if you ensure that uh, the cameras really see at least uh, big portions of the scene from all perspectives, then you have 64 rays 
per pixel on the convex hull, which enables you all this nice little post-processing that Torsten also introduced. The parametrization, consequently, is then the 4D light fields as the typical thing, sub-aperture and pixel on the aperture. Um, and for us, 5D, where we add the temporal component, um, because we also are able to synchronize our cameras, and I'll show you uh, later on, but we are also able to adjust the phase of each individual camera. So they are all in sync with respect to the f uh, frame frequency. So, for example, 40 frames per second. Everyone, uh, all the cameras do 40 frames per second, but in which phase within this frame duration they shoot is very, very finely controllable. Actually, the granularity in our era is 10 microseconds. So with 10 microseconds, you can do this. And you can do everything that you want. You can say every second camera, half of the frame, um, all the cameras in a 64th of the frame, so like stroboscopic effect, or even only a sub-array of three by three who do stroboscopic, and the rest does a normal full-frame capture. You can treat uh, spatial, spatial versus temporal resolutions very freely. Very first impression of our array, so we have been very lucky to find someone who finances uh, or, or has finance, which is not, at least it's clear for the industry, but it's not that uh, self-evident for academia. Um, so we had uh, roughly 150,000 euros uh, for buying the material and all the researchers that put their 2.x, where the x can be significantly beyond the 2 if you calculate all the students that have helped. It's a 100% custom design. You will see this when I show the video of our first captures. And 100% uh, custom design really means all the PCBs for the synchronization have been done ourselves. It goes down to that all the casings and all the cable uh, holders have been done with our own 3D printer. So this is really custom. Advantage is A, it's cheap. And B, it's that modular that if someone plans to build an array and says, hey, we want to do this much bigger because I have much more money. This is extremely modular from the hardware and the software perspective. So if you say, right, let's do it with 12 times 12 cameras, we can provide you the knowledge and the tools to do. As said, it's academia, so it's not secret. secret. We can do it, but it's nevertheless a lot of hard work and experience that flows in, um, also from the software side. But it's really modular, so everyone can have the experience to use such an array. Okay, here's a very first impression. You see uh, several of these videos, but that's just that you have an idea on how this array looks like. So it's a relatively flexible aluminum framing that enables us to do everything from roughly 60 by 60 centimeter up to four by one meter or two by two meter uh, so that you really can adjust the, the array to the, uh, uh, to the requirements. Um, yeah, here's some interviews. You know Volker. Everyone uh, knows Volker, obviously. So I can stop this here. It was just as an for an impression, and there is uh, another video in the slides that shows a capturing that we have done. But then you see what is what are the physical dimensions of the array. Technical specifications, um, in case people are interested, we use the uh, FLIR Backfly cameras. So they have the Sony sensors in. It's 13 millimeter diagonal. 5.86 micrometer square for the pixels, uh, 1920 times 1200 resolution, um, 16 by 10 format, up to 41 frames per second, obviously global shutter because we don't want to have motion artifacts in there. Uh, we use 12 and a half millimeter f over 1.4 uh, lenses. We typically also, as Torsten explained, try to use them um, with a very small aperture so that we really have a large depth of field and can do the things uh, afterwards. Um, the viewing angle is in our case, about 48 degree. The processing obviously is, and there were also the, the questions about the data rate, is quite demanding, let's say. So the array itself produces 72 gigabytes per second. Um, to control this, we have decided to equip each of the cameras with an own um, machine, and there are these Intel NUCs, the small uh, computers, it's Core i5-based NUCs. They are just used for caching the raw content um, and for encoding it into H.264 if we need encoded video. So we also have an, a multi-view encoder real time that is running so that we can produce something that's streamable. For the whole thing that we discussed today, we took raw footage. Raw footage means 12 bits per pixel, 1900 uh, or 1920 times 12, uh, 1200, 40 frames per second, uh, quite a bit. Um, 
And they have, each of these uh, NOOCs comes with a 256, uh, 256 gigabyte solid state disk so that it's fast enough to, re to really cache everything, lasts for roughly between 15 and 20 minutes. And then we have to make a break now capturing, uh, and then the whole thing is connected to a very large, nearly 400 terabyte Ceph storage cluster, um, which then can use two 10 gigabits links, so 20 gigabits per second to uh, empty the caches and put it onto that onto that storage. But overall, that's meanwhile, it, it can be handled um, because you only need like three to four times real time for putting things out of the cache into the storage and to have half an hour of, of a break in a more complicated or several hour shooting proved to be relatively okay. Uh, but still, 70 gigabytes per second is quite a bunch of data uh, that appears. Yeah, custom design I already mentioned. Um, so. The Genlog is a, um, a plane that we've designed on ourselves, so also the PCBs, but even that we would be able to, um, or even willing uh, to offer. Uh, it's controllable per camera. The granularity is about 10 microseconds, and that gives you a very flexible uh, phase. Obviously, it's, it's very important. So most of the post-production tools, and Torsten emphasized that they have also synchronized the camera, most of the post-production tools that are available require that the cameras are synced because you want to do your multi-view um, interpolation based on views that are shot at the same time. If you, uh, if, you, if you distribute your patches somewhere in this 5D space, all your multi-view interpolation tools have to be aware of it, right? Because especially if something moves in the scene, this is critical um, and you have to deal with it. But uh, I think still you can, you can gather more of the scene energy if you do it cleverly in that way. The area, uh, area mechanics are this aluminum frame, 16 by 16 centimeter, up to 4 by 1 meter. At the moment it remains with 64 cameras, but as you see on the right side, uh, we have two of these boxes, uh, 16 nooks in each side of each boxes. So if we add a third or a fourth box, if we have the money and the time, we'll do it. We can make it bigger. Some examples of light fields, because there also was the question before what the difference between the single lens Lytro uh, camera and such an array is. On the lower end, you see an image most probably well known to many of you from shot with a Lytro Illum uh, camera. Uh, that's this B sequence. And on the left side, in, in so the left column, you see an image where just the, the different... Um, pixels are joined so that under each pixel you have the different perspectives. Right? This is why it looks a little bit unsharp if you go to the outside. On the right column we have just resorted. It's exactly the same information in both of the images, left column and right column, but in the right column it's sorted in a way that you just have the subviews. So smaller spatial resolution but each perspective in an own image. In an array, you typically would see, yes, not surprising, on the top right, it's 8 by 8, fully filled, rectangular. This is how the array is built. In the lower, you see the, the black corners. The black corners have the reason that the Lytro Illum doesn't have a rectangle, but it has hexagonal micro lenses. Uh, and actually, if you look at it, especially from the distance, you can even guess the hexagon in there, right? So this is why the subviews are not rectangular filled, but hexagonal. And you also see that. The, and this is why the, why the title is sparse camera arrays versus dense uh, camera arrays or dense light fields. On the left side, you see that the Lytro Illum uh, image looks much sharper because the distance between, the disparity between the different views is much, much smaller. It goes into the sub-pixel range. While obviously in a rig, in a camera rig, you have a disparity that's multiple 10, dependent on the distance, up to multiple 100 pixels. So that can be fairly big. Here's an image that shows a little bit what the filtering can do. Um, top left is just one view out of such a light field. Uh, lower left is a so-called hyperfan filtered version. So that's a thing that's filtered with a so-called four-dimensional filter. Top right is the difference between the original and the filtered uh, one. And you see, okay, indeed, in the middle there is a volume where the difference is zero, where everything is black. And as soon as you go out of that volume, the difference is non-zero, which means that you really can start now volumetric filtering in the domain. And that's obviously a very nice post-production tool. 
Um, it's a little bit complicated mathematically because the two coordinates, unfortunately, are not orthogonal to each other, so you need relatively complex 4D filters, but um, you can do nice things. The right thing is just uh, to, to illustrate that if you do it cleverly, you can really do it better. The, the uh, lower right one is the one that is typically done in mobile handsets today, um, namely just a shift sum, so you take the different images, add them up, but you add them up in a shifted way. Um, and this creates a synthetic depth of field, but you see it's not really a volumetric uh, filtering. There is quite some difference between uh, the top left one. So the, the upper right one would be the real good way to do it, but it's four-dimensional filtering. Okie doke. And that comes now to our own processing chain. Um, and this is now very similar to what Thorsten has introduced in his talk with the exception that it's not 4x2, but 8x8 cameras. So we start, oops, sorry, that was not purpose. I wanted to start the video. Ah, We start with the raw footage. We need to debayer it. So if you move in, the first step, obviously, is the debayering. Then we have the 64 images, which you will see on such a camera array don't have the same color. <laughs> Obviously, so we need color adjustment, so we do color adjustment as the next step. And then comes what uh, has been introduced in the talk before, namely the rectification. So we rectify the images to have a concrete column-wise and row-wise uh, image in there. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit coarse because it's just WMV encoding here. Uh, obviously, each one of the views has full HD. Um, and by the way, this is also maybe uh, interesting to mention. Sometimes we get the question whether the, uh, the single cameras have studio quality. The single cameras themselves don't have studio quality. It would be a pity if they would have because obviously cameras, also 2D cameras, have evolved enormously and are enormously good. But with the 64 views, you cannot only do the things that everyone expects from light fields, view changes uh, or other things. You could also do things like HDR. Uh, imagine if I just shoot the cameras and use the cameras with different approaches. I can have an extremely high uh, dynamic. Um, I can do super resolution. Um, so I can say if I don't want to change perspective, I, change, I just choose one view, one perspective, and then I do a super resolution by all the pixels from all the 64 cameras. They all see the sequence of a slightly different perspective, which is not in integer pixels. So you get a far higher sampling rate spatially. Um, in our array, we have done the first trials, and it's no problem to do a very high, res uh, a, a very high dynamic 4K um, image out of this. So I would say the question, uh, do the cameras have studio quality? No, but does the sum of the cameras enable studio quality? Presumably, presumably yes. OK, good. That was the technical part. Um, this is also the nice thing about me. I can do the technical thing and up to the rectified images, and then I give the rectified images to my creative partners, and I think Jonas will be the next one who will introduce then what we do out of this material. Jonas, yeah. floor is yours. Yeah, so hello everyone from my side as well. My name is uh, Jonas Trotno. I'm um, a part of the research and development team uh, at the Animations Institute at Film Academy here in Ludwigsburg nearby. And I'm here to introduce you to um, a first light field test production that we did in our um, EU-funded project Source. And uh, this project uh, or this um, production is called Unfolding. And what we wanted to do is to have a creative look at light fields. Um, so we wanted to explore the challenges and opportunities that light fields would have when being used in movie productions. Um, this is quite challenging in itself because uh, the technology is currently in development, uh, hardware-wise as well as software-wise. But we anyway wanted to dive into that topic and uh, see how far we can get in the state that it is in currently. Um, the idea also came up uh, because uh, there was a contact um, between the Internationale Musikfestspiele Saar and uh, the University of Saarland. And um, the idea was to produce a trailer for the, those um, music festivals. 
And uh, the concept that we developed uh, is uh, actually developed in um, cooperation with a professional DOP. He's called Matthias Bullier. And um, so we wanted to really um, have a script and uh, have uh, requirements that would also apply to normal movie productions. Uh, in that video, we'll have a, a cello player. Uh, she's called Isabel Geweiler. And she will play um, four times, um, or four, um, um, four different uh, voices of uh, the same um, uh, song. And um, we did the real world post production here at Film Academy, although it's uh, currently uh, only a preliminary um, post production, and we'll improve that throughout the entire project. So, um, to start it off, uh, I would uh, like to show you a small behind the scenes video uh, where we were actually capturing um, Isabel Geweiler in the um, studios of Saarländischer Rundfunk, which we were uh, very glad to use. And I'll just show the video first. Today we're here in Studio One of the Saarländische Rundfunk with participation of several project partners of the European Union funded project Source Smart Asset Reuse for Creative Environments and we have the opportunity to make some shootings um, with the camera rig that's been used in the project and that you see in the background. Und Ton ab. Danke nochmal, Kat. Gut, dann die vier, fünf und Kamera. Läuft. So I think you got an impression on uh, how that light field production uh, could look like. Um, and um, as you saw, we, we used green screen uh, in, the, um, yeah, uh, in the studio and we were trying to um, get as close as possible to, uh, to real production. So we had uh, all the light equipment uh, properly set up and um, yeah. Um, was was a great success, uh, but it also had quite some challenges. Um, there were some really immediate challenges that arise directly after uh, shooting, and uh, my colleague Simon Spielmann will later on talk about um, challenges and opportunities in the post-production process, but immediately, um, first of all, data storage is quite challenging with light fields. Um, we captured uh, 21 minutes of uh, material, which resulted in nine terabytes of data. Um, transferring those were the first step to do, which took already quite some time. And um, then, yeah, really uh, developing algorithms and um, having algorithms at hand that could handle such amounts of data in a convenient way is really challenging and is still in development within uh, the source project. Um, especially when you want to use um, tools that um, are normally used in post-production. So for example, Nuke or Gaffer. Um, it, yeah, they, they simply do not yet really exist um, algorithms for those applications that can be directly used on a 
data like this, so with 64 uh, cameras, um, and we are trying to um, to develop uh, algorithms in the project that are uh, targeting the uh, data that we captured uh, during the unfolding production. Another problem or another challenge was that uh, the rig, as you saw in the video, is uh, quite big in size and uh, needs some significant time for setup and calibration. Um, this is all fine. You can cope for that, but you need to account for it. And uh, the camera also has some physical uh, limitations. So normally you, uh, we were not able to uh, move the rig during shooting because all the cameras had to be in the very same constellation. So they shouldn't move, uh, individual cameras shouldn't move at all. Uh, otherwise the rectification would um, yeah, produce errors. And uh, yeah, the visual quality as uh, Torsten already said, uh, in itself each camera is an in industry, industrial camera, not an Ari Alexa or whatever. Um, but uh, in post-production, we can uh, account for problems that um, um, th those smaller cameras introduce. We can increase the uh, dynamic range. We can increase resolution. But in itself, the cameras um, might not deliver the quality that uh, we are already used to in uh, normal movie productions. Now, um, to plan our shoot, we were actually doing an entire previous um, in CG. We were doing this in Blender and uh, CG we chose because in CG we can actually simulate all the effects that we would want to uh, produce with the real footage afterwards. So, um, for example, um, our unfolding production heavily relied on very narrow fields of view. Uh, very narrow, very narrow um, uh, depths fields, basically, and uh, we wanted to simulate lenses with, uh, for example, a focal length of um, 50 millimeters and um, some um, aperture of 0 0.01 or something, which is physically impossible but can be used on actual captured footage with a light field and you can obviously simulate that in CG and that is what we did in advance besides uh, planning uh, what shoots we what shots we actually need to do for the entire uh, song that we are going to capture um, are needed and um, yeah which effects are actually possible with those uh, light fields we are focusing most on focus and depths of fields so that can be adjusted in post-production. So um, we captured everything completely sharp and then we would introduce depth of field in post-production. We can also animate that depth of field in post-production and we can also use um, tilt shift um, yeah, lens effects uh, that we can uh, add to the uh, original footage. We can also slightly shift the perspective and we are also uh, looking into how this shift in perspective can probably be used in uh, new display devices. Simon will talk about that in a second as well. And um, since we are uh, generating depth maps, uh, they can also um, assist when you're uh, chroma keying. They won't replace chroma keying entirely, but they can assist you for that. And um, we also brought the uh, previous video, um, which I can show you here now. It's a really rough estimation of what uh, the final product wants to be. There's no animated characters in there, but I think uh, it's good to see um, how or what effects can actually be achieved with the light field. So uh, we would start uh, in the video with uh, being completely blur blurred out and the cello player will come in uh, from behind. And uh, when, it, when, as soon as she starts playing, the focus will actually shift to the bow and will follow the bow uh, wherever uh, the player um, is holding it. Then we'll have a tilt shift. This is currently only a preview, which will then um, tilt towards the uh, eyes of the cello player. And then the when the different um, uh, voices are coming in, also uh, the different uh, versions of uh, Isabel Gewella will blend into 
the scenery um, is all um, tailored to be in a white room, although we could also add uh, another scenery uh, to the environment. And uh, with this uh, previous, I would like to hand over to Simon Spielmann, which will go more into detail about the actual post-production. Thank you. Yeah, again, hello. Uh, Simon from Film Academy's R&D team. Um, now, well, let's imagine uh, after the shoot, Torsten came to to Ludwigsburg with a bunch of hard drives in his back and we're trying, uh, sitting there with our new pipeline and trying to process something like nine terabyte of data, which is, uh, uh, yeah, almost insane. But no, uh, we didn't do it like this. We transferred it via uh, a web server. But what we did, uh, um, we started at the beginning. We would like to have something like a basis to compare um, a maybe upcoming light field production pipeline with a classical, already existing new base pipeline. So therefore, we started, um, yeah, old school, uh, post-production uh, to figure out what can be achieved with standard software. Um, and uh, we basically did a multi-view stereo production here. So we already used um, the available uh, perspectives, uh, 64 camera perspectives here to generate dev maps, and then uh, came up with an um, workflow uh, which is based on or was based on Cara VR and Ocular um, to generate, um, yeah, well, um, the expected effects here. So the almost finished uh, pre-production is here and I can show it now. So outcome of our evaluation. So based on the existing new pipeline, it's well, it's a lot of manual work if you want to achieve something like this. Um, it's hard or almost uh, impossible to match real lens effects, even if you would like to simulate uh, physical impossible uh, lenses here. Um, it's, it's hard to control and uh, it's, it's really limited in, in terms of freedom and creative choices. Because what you end up with is something like this death, uh, death uh, maps here and every effect you basically saw in the video is based on this death maps. And you have to do a lot of manual cleaning and fixing to uh, push it to this quality we have seen here. So on the other side, basically everything is faked. So it's a depth controlled 2D blur uh, to simulate this depth of field of a lens. Uh, there is no physical correctness and um, yeah, well, it highly depends on this quality of the depth maps. So um, we are hoping that uh, in further developed tools during the uh, lifetime of source, we could push it further and utilize uh, the real potential of light field data. Therefore, we have some really first results from our project partners. You can see it here. 
this is um, directly coming out out of a prototypic algorithm um, implemented in, in MATLAB here, which is at the moment uh, suffers a lot of, uh, of artifacts and it's not that fast. But you can see that it goes into a uh, direction. So this is not that based here. This really uh, uses our light field data to uh, create all these uh, multiple, uh, to create this step of field by uh, merging all these views. Um, so where we would like to go. So, well, first of all, better depth maps because that's the key to a lot of effects, maybe also to replace the, cre uh, the green screen uh, in future or to uh, well, have a better solution of uh, um, separating objects uh, in, in uh, 3D scenery. Even to do a 3D reconstruction, uh, we also did some tests, you can see on the upper right there. Um, uh, we also would, would like to push it further to uh, even have something like uh, surface char characteristics of uh, or like materials or shading properties of, of surfaces here. Um, and as uh, Torsten already mentioned, the control of motion artifacts imposed like motion blurs and things like this would also be possible with a 5D uh, uh, light field data. Um, as well as uh, some improvements in quality like resolution. Um, yes. Then also the idea, well, what you have seen is so far made for a classical 2D, 2D display, what doesn't mean that we, we just stick to uh, classical 2D presentations of it. We could also think about stereoscopic or other, or other stereoscopic uh, displays, even light field and holographic, holographic displays will be uh, possible to support. So we are currently looking in what is uh, actually on the market and of course also uh, a topic here, AR and VR representations of the scenery. Um, by the way, if you're interested in playing around with such data, we're providing on, under this URL um, element shots made with the camera from, from uh, the universities of Saarbrücken. So if um, you would like to have a look, then just visit the site. It's freely available. and. If you would like to have more information about this, uh, you could have a look on our source project page under www.sourceproject.eu and uh, the project partners, the Saarland Information Campus and the Research at Animation Institute. So now it's time for questions. So maybe it's important to add that um, Source is a three-year project that uh, is, is pretty much at the middle of the project. So it's one and a half more years to go. So there's a lot of things that will be coming up and will be published in the next month. So. Um, you were talking that you were using um, multi-view stereo reconstruction. What did you use for that? Mm -hmm. So there's several things here. So uh, we. We did a uh, typical single stereo reconstruction and we have some uh, tools from our project partners. Uh, in detail, it's Trinity College Dublin, which are able to use m uh, more than one or more than two views to uh, create a, a depth map or a disparity map out of this data. Okay, thanks. Did you have uh, one depth map overall or did you have different depth maps for every single camera view? We have different depth maps for every. Um, regarding the depth maps, um, uh, I think you, you told you had to fix a lot by hand, and um, I think uh, you, the, sh the shooting of the green screen is uh, not the easiest uh, thing for depth es estimation because you, you don't have a lot of structure on the background. Wouldn't it be better shooting, or, or, or did you shoot other things than that? Um, Green screen and 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 where the depth map uh, better? Yeah, good question. Uh, well, it basically helps uh, because um, mostly these algorithms can construct a good depth of 
detailed objects or subjects or whatever, uh, but really has problems on, on sharp edges. And if you, you could really support these algorithms uh, if you have a, a proper key, just to key out backgrounds. Uh, but yes, you're right, if you would have a structured background, uh, it would be easier to have a correct depth of this background. So, well, yes, yes and no. <laughs> Uh, would the techniques and tools you're using also be applicable to use it for like 180 or 360 panoramic uh, light fields? In theory, yes. Yes. Uh, Thorsten? Yep. In theory, yes. Uh, I mean, at the moment, most of the algorithms, at least that, that we have done, um, assume that there is a planar rig. Um, so if you do 360, a typical way would be to take the opening angle and shift the planar rig uh, around. This is what Lytro also has done in the uh, Hallelujah production. So that, that's possible. Um, we will most probably within the duration of the project also experiment with non-planar um, arrangements in the area and then it might be much easier even uh, to do this. But in principle it's possible. How much effort did you put into the camera calibration and what is the outcome? Yeah. Um, maybe, you, maybe Johannes makes the question clear, A or B, what, what is the camera? Each individual camera or the light field camera? Um, it's the light field camera. The light field camera, yeah. yeah. So um, actually in, in each setup for each scene when we move the array, we indeed have captured a, um, a calibration scene. Um, and I have to say that meanwhile, and this uh, is also kind of an effort, but uh, we have gone through a learning curve where we meanwhile have, a, have algorithms that do the calibration relatively well. Distortion correction for the lenses is relatively um, simple. Um, they, are, they are very stable, so that has been done um, offline. And we can, with, with this calibration scene, meanwhile, um, very fastly calibrate the rig for one scene automatically. So we have done nearly no manual adjustment uh, of the automatic calibration that we have used. But these guys have to tell you whether they need to shift uh, by further half a pixel or something. But the, the rectification that comes out of our algorithm, meanwhile, is, is really relatively good. Yeah. yeah, well, basically, as better the calibration already, the physical calibration is, the better your, your quality will be, so that's obvious. So we tried for this production to be as physical accurate as possible, so we tried to really uh, narrow down every single camera here. But this was, by the way, the second professional production done at all with this camera rig. Uh, over here. Um, I noticed that in this project, uh, the Foundry was also listed. And a couple of years ago, we had a demo here by the Lytro that showed new uh, tools. Is the Foundry going to be developing anything similar to that for this project? <laughs> I don't think so, uh, not at least for this project, as far as I know. Um, Foundry is involved in these projects for other topics. Hmm. The, the tools that you're speaking of have been uh, Lytro proprietary tools. So even yeah. Foundry uh, has an access, at least not the rights to use them. So uh, the, an the answer is no. <laughs> um, on the other hand, there is obviously um, collaborations. Um, and I mean, Thorsten introduced that they have uh, also tools for, for Nuke. Uh, so I think we're, we're all trying. And this is also the good news for, for this, this afternoon. I mean, the, the interest in light fields is increasing. So many unsolved things. So we're not at all competitors to each other, but we all try to, to gather uh, things. And if there is someone who does Nuke tools, then we try to uh, to collaborate in a way that we can make them, um, yeah, that we can make them running because simply they, they are not able yet uh, to work with the data rates that we have. So simply uh, Nuke crashes <laughs> very often, um, and it's good to have people who have the Nuke tools and Foundry in the game. But to the best of my knowledge, Foundry is not developing light field tools because the Lytro tools have also not come from Foundry, but they have come from Lytro. Yeah, but but at the end, it needs to be in some application you, an artist can use. So well, yet it, it will end up uh, in some tool. So my my question is actually about audio. How did you sync up the four performances? 
did you have the ch a cellist with perfect tempo? Uh, did you have to time warp her performance? Was she playing on top of the previous take so that she knew exactly how to line it up? Was there a visual metronome? How, how did you <laughs> line it up? Nothing like this. Uh, Isabel is just good enough to play at the same speed, so we had nothing like this. We had the time code, uh, but he, uh, she played uh, every voice uh, after each other. So yeah. And then it just it lined matches, up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I guess people are good. She, she, got, a bass, she, she got a bass tacked in, in her ear, so she could uh, yeah, hold the, the right tempo, metronome. but she didn't get any, any uh, pre-recorded um, um, version of, of the previous voices or so. So while I'm walking to the next <laughs> person, I, w I just would like to mention that there is actually something called a creative user group for Project Source. So it doesn't mean you have to sign up uh, uh, for a subscription, 10, month, uh, 10 bucks a month, but it means you can um, get information about the activity within the project. So uh, all you need to do is look up Source EU project at LinkedIn and click the join button and then you get more information and you're part of the user group then. Yeah, hi. Can you uh, tell me a little bit more about your defocusing algorithm? Did you calculate virtual views and uh, process them together, or did you make only a blur based on the depths? Or the, for the result you have seen here, so for the for the light field result, which was a little bit uh, um, separated, and or for the for the result you you have seen in the video. The video was based on a on, uh, new standard defocus node, okay. so I have no information about internals there. And the other one uh, is an uh, algorithm we got from our project partners, which just fuses the, the, the views generated by the light code. Um, uh, 64 cameras is quite, quite big <laughs> data, yes. But uh, I think it's still a, a sparse light field. So do you, do you calculate a dense light field from that data, or do you use just that, uh, that uh, sparse light field for the algorithms? I mean, at, at the moment, indeed, you use just the sparse light field. Um, on the other hand, you obviously do um, multi-view or interview um, interpolation on the go. Uh, so essentially you have uh, denser light fields that you calculate, but the original data is, you are completely right, is sparse. So we have to deal with all these aliasing. You cannot uh, straightforwardly apply, uh, shift some filters uh, because they will produce aliasing, uh, especially at the, at the outer cameras. So it needs to be considered. That's why I said it's 4D filtering, relatively uh, sophisticated. Um, yeah, but we, we have, it has not been shown here, we have also, because we need also as universities some algorithms to show, we have um, not depth map based, but plane sweeping based, so with a restricted number of depth planes, interview interpolation, and that runs on GPUs already in real time, and doesn't look too bad, actually. So um, things are coming, things are improving more and more, but the answer to your question is, we use the sparse light field. We already showed in small, uh sample there uh, with, a, with a pen, a camera pen, so it, this was actually an interpolation between the views. All right, so I think we're done with the questions now. Uh, that was an insight into EU-funded project source. Stay tuned for more information and we'll continue in 15 minutes with Valérie from Technicolor Research. <laughs>